Hi, everyone. I want to tell you a story about information technology. If you go back to ancient times, this is what information technology looked like. You take something very sharp, and you find some flat surface, like stone, and then you write down your note. Um, not the most convenient way to write your diary, but something happened uh, about 2,000 years ago. And this is something that we still enjoy today. As a matter of fact, probably all of you have some on your hand right now. That's called paper. Paper was manufactured or started being manufactured about 2,000 years ago. And we still enjoy it. And that really revolutionized our civilization. It changed how we record. It changed how we communicate. And it changed how we process information. So if you look at this amazing technology called paper, what made it possible? First step is making the material paper. And second is the development of writing. You start with pen and pencil. You go to wood-based printing, metal-based printing, and then today's personalized printing. And that's not it. You actually need to integrate all this information to something that is portable and searchable. And what that means is that you need to integrate all these sheets of paper to something called a book. That's binding. And then you need to put them all together in a searchable mechanism that's called library. And so, as you can see, information technology started from materials development, then all kinds of techniques, and then you go to even something more amazing. And that's the story of information technology for 2,000 years. And then something happened in the last century. That's called integrated circuits. That, again, revolutionized information technology. But the way that this technology was built was very similar. First, we start with new material. That's called silicon. Uh, it's kind of stone, but it is much better and expensive stone in the sense that it's crystalline. Uh, we record our information not with pen and pencil, but instead we record our information using electrical current. And we learn to control their electrical current by using a technique called lithography. And it is expensive. Uh, you need to put billions of dollars to have a facility to build one of these. And that's not it. Then you need to integrate them so that you can put a lot of information. Uh, and finally, you need to make them connected using something called internet. So you see, you start from materials revolution, you go to technology, and then you go to integration. That is the story of information technology once again in the past century. Now, who has uh, one of these integrated circuits in your pocket? Raise your hand. Right? It's everyone. <laughs> now we enjoy cell phone, right? It's the culmination of amazing technology that has developed over the past of few decades. It's quite amazing. We all carry this amazing technology in our pocket that gives you immediate access to amazing wealth of information, and also you can communicate. Now, why am I telling you all this story? Because I'm interested in this question, what's next? What can happen um, to make this information technology move forward, what kind of new things do we need to build now so that we can enjoy something amazing later? One way of answering this question is to make all these integrated circuits much, much, much thinner. How thin? 
atomically thin. You cannot go thinner than this, it turns out. So we want to make circuits that are atomically thin. Uh, it has to be pretty strong, otherwise it's not going to be useful. And once you do this, you might be able to do amazing things, like you can fold it, and then you can do other things as well. So that's very interesting. So let's say if you build it, what can you do? Uh, you can answer these kind of questions in many different ways, because once you build new kinds of technology, often you don't know what's going to come out, right? The first inventor of transistor would not have guessed that we will have smartphone, for instance. Well, just to guess, uh, I can just share one vision that I have is something like this. How about we give a cell phone to every cell in our body, right? And that sounds ridiculous. But of course, you know, cell cannot talk to you. They cannot tell you a story. But if you can listen to them uh, very, with very simple words, such as, I'm hungry, it's too cold, I'm under attack, wouldn't that be amazing? So for, to do this, well, we probably need something that is very flexible, light, and then thin, but at the same time, we should be able to put a lot of devices onto this tiny, tiny package. For that, it is possible that atomically thin circuits will do some good. So this is a very interesting story so far, I hope, uh, but important question for scientists like us uh, is, how to do it, what do we need it, right? So let's say you want to build integrated circuit that is very, very thin, then somehow, somehow people need to develop all these skills to be able to do it. So what are those skills? And it turns out that if you analyze what has been done in the manufacturing of books and manufacturing of integrated circuits, then you can get some very important clues. Let's look at books. If you want to generate integrated information platforms such as book, you first need to start with paper, high quality, big, cheap. Then you need to learn to write or color in a way that you like. Then you need to integrate them vertically or you just need to bind them so that you can generate this integrated platform. And so we want to do very similar things with atomically thin materials and circuits. So let me just introduce you uh, the steps one by one. We want to generate paper or semiconductor that is atomically thin, first step. Two, we want to be able to combine different kinds of materials side by side, that is patterning. And then once that's done, we want to integrate them vertically, layer by layer. That looks like a book, right? So that's very straightforward. Well, if I say this uh, you know, sentence, like that's very straightforward to my uh, students, then probably they won't be very happy. But in terms of idea, that is straightforward. So let me just show you some of the results that we have uh, developed in the past few years. This is a photo of a wafer uh, or glass substrate. On the surface of that, we actually have three atom thick semiconductor. So it is a film, it's so transparent you cannot see, but believe me, there is a semiconductor on it. It's only three atoms thick and it's everywhere and you can make devices out of it. And it turns out that on this wafer, we have thousands of transistors made with three atoms thick semiconductor. So we know how to do it. And it turns out that there are many kinds of different semiconductors and metals that are very, very, very thin. So researchers around the world are working toward realizing their properties in big scale. And we are working on that. So that is the first. We grow material with very good properties. Now, we need to be able to pattern them. So when you think about patterning paper, that's pretty straightforward. You start with paper and then you put ink on it. We really cannot do that with atomic materials. And it turns out that the best way to do it 
is that you take blue paper and the red paper, you connect them side by side. And so what you are seeing is all three atom thin material seen from the top, but you can see that there are two kinds of materials that are connected side by side. So this is a technique that we have been developing in my lab. Uh, and when you do that, and when you do it very well, they will be connected side by side with almost no defects or no errors. And that really encourages us that this might be possible uh, to be further developed. So that's two. Now the third step is to be able to integrate them vertically to make a book out of them. And the clue for that is, can be found from, for instance, post-it notes. And if you look at post-it notes, they stick very nicely, right? Uh, and papers do not have very sticky glues either. And that's indeed very similar to what we did with our material. So post-it notes. Uh, and what you are seeing looks like post-it notes, right? So we have two kinds of atomically thin semiconductor. One looks brighter, one looks darker. And it's so thin that we had to use a special microscope that's called electron microscope to be able to see this cross-section. And each layer is three atoms thick, and it is about six angstroms. Very, very thin. And we can put them on top of another to make programmed elaborate structures as seen here. So now we have three skills that we taught ourselves how to grow semiconductor or paper, how to pattern them, and how to stack them on top of another. Uh, using these skills, I I'm convinced that we ought to be able to generate integrated circuits that are big and then small and then flexible. What is next? Um, we've had integrated circuits that's made out of silicon before. Uh, what new things can you do? And sometimes we are inspired by our childhood memories. And so our inspiration comes from, again, what you all know, folding paper, right? So it turns out that when you look at paper, you write on it, but another thing that you do is that you fold. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it's just fun, right? Because I believe we start with two-dimensional objects or something flat, and then you fold to mimic three-dimensional things, puppies, airplane. And if you connect these paper pieces with something like a motor, and actually you can make a very nice moving things, like small paper robots. And it turns out that there are fantastic research going on in that direction as well. So why am I telling you this? I'm talking about atomically thin circuits, and all of a sudden I'm talking about toys. Uh, it turns out that there is a very interesting opportunity that's developing in this area. Um, before I go there, let me just show you this to answer the following question. How do we make three-dimensional objects out of just a piece of paper? So if you look at this, then there is a paper. Uh, and there, there are a bunch of folding lines, right? So folding backward and folding inward. Uh, you can actually design this very carefully. And then if you fold them step by step, uh, following the sequence accurately, then you can pretty much design anything that you want to bank. And can you guess what this will become if you fold them correctly? Well, it's hard, right? So I'm going to show you a video. OK. You can see we can make a lot of different things with this. But still, I haven't connected the dots. Uh, let's say we have a circuit that's made out of really, really thin material. And now, we have another technique that we have uh, in real life scale, how to fold paper to something that is three-dimensional. Uh, can you do the same thing with atomically thin material? And it turns out that uh, what we do 
in real life can be done with atomically thin material as long as you scale everything down together. So what I mean by that is that, let's say you have a piece of paper, you shrink it by a thousand times, as long as the thickness of the material is reduced by a thousand times, exactly by the same factor, then what you do will be identical. And this is actually what has been proven by my thesis advisor and longtime collaborator, Professor Paul McKeon at Cornell University. So what you are seeing is, well, the following. The top row shows all these real-life information or exam, examples that shows just regular paper art. You cut out, and then you stretch or you pull, uh, see what happens. And you just shrink this design to very, very, very small scale, roughly about 1,000 times. This time, you are not using regular paper. Instead, you are using one atom thing material, and in this case, that's called graphene. Amazingly, you can see that. So that graphene is visible at the bottom, and you see what results is very similar, real life and small scale. So this is the way that we make connecting the dots. We start from big scale design, and if you work very hard at it, then we might be able to turn this folding or cutting paper art into something that is really small and therefore useful. So with this, there, there can be a lot of interesting things that you can try, or at least imagine. And since we, I don't have real devices, I'm going to just imagine. What can you do, for instance? Let's say, if you look at parachute, you have this big, big, big cloth. Uh, you cannot carry it. So you need to fold in, nine, neatly into a bag. You carry it, when you need it, you unfold. What that means is that normally it'll be pretty big, but if you fold, it becomes tight package. And this ought to be useful when you want to deploy a lot of integrated circuits and devices into tight volume and then tight surfaces. So what that means is that it, this might be useful when you want to spray all your sensors or circuits or devices using aerosols or inject them using needles. It turns out that the size of a cell can pack a lot of devices using this approach. You take something big and then fold to make it really, really tiny. That can be something useful. And another thing that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, but I didn't elaborate because it's very hard to do, is to make these circuits move. Wouldn't it be amazing if these circuits that has a lot of devices, transistors, even camera, uh, if we can move around upon outside the queue? We are working on it, and hopefully we can realize some distant future if that is possible, then it, the reality will mimic what happens in a movie, right? Tiny, tiny robots or tiny, tiny sentinels that go into your body and report back to you about your health, for instance, or the clarity of sky, or how clean the air is. And this is an exciting future that we can dream of right now, but this is a dream that worth dreaming. Thank you.